<laughs> yeah, good. yeah, he has a basilisk arm now. Isn't that something? <laughs> All right, so I wanted to bring up a topic uh, in our DM discussion. Oh, you're hoping to land on an armless creature, says Dark Wolf. Yeah, but I don't know, if you get an eye stalk or something as an arm, that'd be interesting, too. Or you get a leg for an arm. But anyway, there you go, Death Count. You got one of those. This is something that I thought would be good advice for any of you who are DMs. And if you have a concept in mind about, oh, I'm, I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to run this, this, you know, grand epic quest or, you know, some big campaign or something beyond maybe just a couple low levels and the like. Uh, this is a consideration for you because as your characters grow in level, your world is going to become smaller and that's going to happen in one of three ways. They're going to get a greater access to communication, to travel, and to knowledge about what's happening in the world around them. You know, you start as, you know, you're the son of a farmer in the country in a little village. It's isolated. You know, it might take a day to get to uh, a day's worth of travel to get to the neighboring town or something. Or it could take even half a day to get to a marketplace. So going shopping took all day. You spent half your day going there. You shopped and it took half a day getting back. Or, you know, like your waking hours, I should say. And so that that is something to consider when you're going through... Um... A level one adventurer might get a mule and a cart. Yvelon, you disagree with that concept. Which concept are you disagreeing with? That the world gets smaller? Or that people get access to greater methods of travel? Well, so you have, in combat, you know that you have a speed, right? You have a speed of 30 feet normally, sometimes 25. Though there's also some things that are, uh, you know, we have movement and, and speed, which is a travel speed. While traveling, a group of adventurers can move at a normal, fast, or slow pace as shown in the travel pace table. The table states how far a party can move in a period of time and whether the pace has any effect. A fast pace means characters are less perceptive, while a slow pace means it's possible to sneak around and to search an area more carefully. So if you want to go on a forced mar oh, the concept of the world's going to get smaller when you play higher levels. It just, that's the one sentence blurb. Um, I mean, if you follow, if you follow along, then hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense. But it'll get smaller in the sense that it is going to be easier for them to communicate and travel and be able to get around. The world won't seem as big as it once was. So anyway, it gets into here. Force March. Uh, you can. It assumes that you're traveling for eight hours a day. You can push beyond that at risk of exhaustion uh, for each additional hour, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, but anyway, um, you can go at a Force March. There's mounts and vehicles. Mage, bedtime for you. Have a great night. Thank you for joining us as long as you had. And so there's character. You can ride in a wagon. You could ride a horse. Uh, and, you know, there's different horses and other animals that have different travel speeds. Uh, characters in a waterborne vessel are limited to the speed of the vessel, and they don't suffer penalties for a fast pace or gain benefits from a slow. Uh, so here you have, let me zoom in a little bit further. If you travel at a fast pace, uh, you can uh, you can move, uh, for, you're moving at four miles an hour, or in a day you can travel 30 miles. And if you're moving, look, you're, you're kind of taking a light jog, or you're just walking briskly, you're not going to be as observant because you're focused on the road, you're focused on the travel ahead. You can move at a normal pace 
and and uh, travel 24 miles in a day. Or if you're going slowly, you're gonna travel 18 miles, and you're but you'll be able to use stealth, so you can be super sneaky. Ranger has some things that allows this to bump up, and I think Druid might as well. Now, where are you getting something like 300 feet in a minute? Well, remember, a round is only 6 seconds. So, therefore, there are 10 rounds in a minute. 10 times 30 is 300. So, every hour, you can travel 3 miles in 8-hour march. There you go. Bubonic one is taunting Norton. Itty bitty Noel got hurt by the animal. One thirty second, its power level. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe uh, someone played an illusion trick on Norton, making him think he was something that perhaps, <laughs> perhaps Norton was not. Be careful though, Bubonic. A Noel is still a Noel. Uh, so anyway, this this chapter goes into climbing, swimming, crawling, traveling over difficult terrain. You know, if you're traveling through rain or slush or something, it'll slow you down. But this is the standard, right? A level one character that can move normally at uh, 300 at 30 feet, uh, speed of 30 feet, you can travel for eight hours and make 24 miles in a day. Um, if you're making maps. As a DM, you can use that as a, you can use that as a guideline. Would one village be a day's travel away from the next, or would it be three days travel? However, maybe there's an enterprising NPC that set up a trading post or an inn um, a day out from either location, something like that. Uh, and so it's not an established, it's not a city, it doesn't have a city guard, but it's a place that the characters can rest that's a, a, on average a day out from a, a particular place. And those places might act as, uh, not mile markers, but as day markers of travel along a road. Yeah, think about things like that. <clears throat> now, as your characters level up, they are going to move more quickly. Uh, for instance, if if you have a uh, you have a horse that can move sixty feet, or some other animal that can move sixty feet, you're going to be doubling this, meaning that you on horseback can travel almost fifty miles in a day if you're going at a normal pace. Maybe a little more, maybe a little less. That will depend on how hard you push things. And if that's the case, are your villages as a DM a mile, or not a mile, a day's walk away from each other, or a day's ride away from each other? Norton says, hush you, silence. And unlike goblins and orcs, gnolls aren't complete morons. Well, we know where bubonic one lies. <laughs> where your allegiance is, I mean, not where you're, un where you're telling a fib. Now, can this make a difference in how you're pacing your story? Well, it's it's good to consider, right? If you want to put a, a time limit of sorts on your characters, say they have three days to reach the next village with the sacrifice, otherwise the volcano will blow up or something. Well, you got to consider what's above here. Or, as your players grow in level, they will find ways to travel even more quickly. And I've listed some spells. I, I, I went through and I started listing, all right, well, this is what the bards are getting and, and going from there. And it was going to take way too much time to have a complete list. And a complete list, I can make one and post it if you're curious. But I think that what I have up here is going to be enough for the presentation that we're going through. Yeah, it is a gaze attack death count. So really, you just have like this really swole like lizard arm with some claws or something. Let me zoom back out. So this is overland travel. And there's a separate chart for sea travel. And look, if you're flying, um, a fly speed... A fly speed doesn't necessarily make you quicker. 
Like, uh, look, a fly speed of 60 is the same as a ground speed of 60. Where the two differ is if you're flying, you can be a lot more direct in where you're going. If the two villages are separated by 50 miles, but a lot of that is is a is like curving out and then coming back to get around a big mountain or a hill, you could presumably just fly straight over the mountain and and be there in much shorter time traveling at the same miles per hour that you are over land. It's just because you're not landbound. So that's why things like uh flying, you know, a concept or a spell like flying in D&D can have major ramifications on your map and on your world. The speed doesn't change, but the method that they go to get from point A to point B does. And your, your world isn't just about travel speed. Your world is about how, how do they learn about what's around them? You know, how can they speak to certain people? If you start in a farming village, there might be, I don't know, some kind of a, um, what would be a, a good word? Like a, a pastor, you know, you're not going to have like an archbishop of the of the domain of the faith or whatnot in Farming Village, presumably, unless maybe you have a retired one or something. Um, so you might have one person in a magical sense who can communicate magically with other people. You might have someone who can uh, send out mundane bird messages, not even through Animal Messenger, but... You know, tie a little note to a raven's claw and then, you know, send it off to the next village. You could have something like that. And so you would get some uh, some information trickling in. You know, especially if you only have one person, like the old bishop who's retired in the countryside. Uh, and he might not even tell the village everything. You know, if there's a war brewing and he wants to keep everyone safe, uh, he might only just relay, I don't know, the weather or something. Yep, carrier pigeons, something like that. I mean, because that was the telegram at the time. Think about what the telegram did for the United States and other countries as it was adopted. Bubonic one, time to head to Eulash and Stompy, stomp, stomp on some Moander cultists. Is, oh, that, that's the uh, that's the older video games of D and D that you're playing through, correct? Uh, so anyway, as a DM, consider the speed of of communication, not just the overland speed that your group can travel. You can also bear in mind that there's a speed of knowledge. How quickly can they find information about hidden people or objects or locations or... Um, instead of taking three days to scour the forest for, uh, you know, for a cave entrance... Uh, they could use... Well, here, we can start with some mechanics. They might use Beast Sense, if you have a character in your party that uh, can take this spell, and the wolf might even live in the cave and can lead you to it. And so that takes three days of activity now down into one or two castings of Beast Sense in order to learn about the world around you. So just... I'm not saying this to set up a DM versus PC arrangement. I want to bring this up as a consideration as a DM that your players are going to, through the course of playing and leveling, either themselves or through uh, NPCs you generate, have the ability to cut down on investigations, on travel time, and things like that because of the use of various spells that they cast themselves or maybe they get someone else to cast on them. Let's go over to spells. It, I went through the bard section first, so you can see there's a lot here. Now, there are others that bards cannot cast. Well, not normally, but there are abnormal bard spells. Oh, Bubonic says, uh, yeah, part three, finish all the mini dungeons, including the Beholder Core. Oh. Let's look at uh, let's look at a spell. Uh, let's look at the cantrip message. Okay, this is gonna flash a little bit as I'm going over here. The 
you point your finger toward a creature within range and whisper a message. The target and only the target hears the message and can reply in a whisper that only you can hear. You can cast this spell through solid objects if you're familiar with the target and know it is beyond the barrier. Magical silence, one foot of stone, one inch of common metal, a thin sheet of lead, or three feet of wood blocks the spell. The spell doesn't have to follow a straight line and can freely travel around corners or through openings. Now, is this going to be a really big game changer to be able to whisper 120 feet away to someone maybe in another room? Not necessarily. Look, you can do this an unlimited amount of times. You just keep wiggling your like you, you speak into your hand and you know, you you, you keep doing this and uh, and you're going to spread messages. But what this can do is, I don't know, you, you get your face, your face player character is going to interact with the NPC, and then they're going to have maybe the brains character whisper uh, what to say into the ear of your face, of your face character. And so it's, it's clever. Could you say it circumvents what you were hoping that the whole party would show up and present itself? Yes. You know, if you really wanted the whole party to show up, why didn't they? Is that on you as a DM, or are they just being super cautious PCs? But this is a way to make your world smart, uh, smaller. Suddenly, 120 feet is one inch away by actually whispering. So the world has been reduced in that sense. Yeah, exactly. Delcorin gives a really good use of the whisper cantrip. Back, message is huge in an intrigue game. Yes. And the fact it's a cantrip can be very powerful too, Derek. So we go through and we say, all right, well, so how else can your world get smaller as your characters level up? Look at comprehend language. Suddenly, someone from a different country or a different race than yours comes into town, like they're the only one or they're from 100 miles away. You cast Comprehend Language, and you can understand the thoughts and ideas from far outside of your own region. And so now we have a level one spell that has reduced the size of your world, in a sense, because the, the neighboring country of orcs that is maybe 200 miles away is now understandable to you, and you can, you can understand them as well as if you were a native. And so their culture, their words, everything presents themselves to you. Look at speak with animals. What do all of the animals know and see around you? How far do they move in a day, especially if they can fly? If you can speak with birds or wolves or uh, even overland oxen, you know, they've just come into town uh, from either a plowed field or the next town over or something along those lines. If you can speak with animals and learn what animals know, they can they can be your agents. They can travel further away. And again, so here we have small farming village. And even with these level one spells, you're bringing information and communication closer to you. As if you've grown up among the orcs your entire life. At level two, you can send an animal messenger. Let's go up to that. This will flash a little bit. By means of this spell, you use an animal to deliver a message. Choose a tiny beast you can see within range, such as a squirrel, blue jay, or bat. You specify a location which you must have visited and a recipient who matches a general description, such as a man or woman dressed in the uniform of the town guard, or a red-haired dwarf wearing a pointed hat. You also speak a message up to 25 words. The target beast travels for the duration of the spell toward the specified location, covering about 50 miles per 24 hours for a flying messenger, or 25 for animal messengers. When the messenger arrives, it delivers your message to the creature that you described, replicating the sound of your voice. The messenger speaks only to a creature matching the description you gave. If the messenger doesn't reach its destination before the spell ends, the message is lost and the beast makes its way back to where you cast the spell. And uh, you can increase it with higher slots. So this is a way... Now, you do have... You had to have been to the location before or met the person. 
And that's fine, but, you know, let's say that you've already gone to the neighboring village. Now, it takes a day of horseback riding to do so, but here, by, uh, let's see, it's casting time, so in six seconds, you have delivered an important message uh, to someone that it would have taken all of your efforts over a 24-hour period, or eight hours of travel anyway, to do. So you saved yourself about eight hours, let's say. Maybe even uh, maybe even more, depending on how you're using it. Then that frees your players up. If we're DMs, it frees your players up to craft items, to research, to go out and bonk goblins while they sent out, you know, a blue jay to fly over to the next town and tell the guard, hey, there's goblins, watch out. So it, it's making this opportunity more available to your players. It's making the world smaller, or it's specializing what people are doing in the world so that you can accomplish more and more quickly. It's, it's like a process of automation, if you think about it. Sending. Uh, then we have... Uh, and sending is... Actually, sending is a, a, lot, uh, a lot more uh, liberal in its interpretation here. Let's uh, scroll. It's going to flash a little bit. Autolux, Prismatic. Sending. You send a short message of 25 words or less to a creature with which you are familiar. The creature hears the message in its mind, recognizes you as the sender if it knows you, and can answer in a manner immediately, in a like manner immediately. The spell enables creatures with intelligence scores of at least one to understand the meaning of your message. So you can tell Lassie, you know, the dog, to go fetch something, or you can um, you can say hi to Grandma, who lives actually in, in the next kingdom over, so it's maybe like 500 miles away. Um, on, in one action, you can send Grandma effectively an email of... Uh, um, dun, 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 dun. Yeah, of 25 words. You can send the message across any distance and even to other planes of existence, but there is a target. Uh, but if the target is on a different plane than you, there's a five percent chance that the message doesn't arrive. So there you go. By level three, as long as you're familiar, uh, familiar with a creature, you can have these kinds of conversations back and forth across any distance. That now the entire world, at least in as your familiarity is is there. The entire world is now six seconds away from you. Now, does that mean that it just because you know the name of, um, you know, of, of uh, well, you will use King Von Ale here. Just because you may know King's name, his true name uh, is, uh, by the way, is uh, Benavre True Good. Just because you know Benavre doesn't mean your sending will go to Benavre. This is a little bit of a, of a gray area. You as a DM are going to have to determine what is familiar. How familiar are you? How, how do you measure that? We have a spell that combines fluff and crunch together. You know, do you have to have known... Are, does someone have to be a friend or a family member? Does someone have to... I don't know. Let's say you made a brand new friend. How long would you have had to hang out for that to qualify them being a sending recipient? Yeah, ex there you go, Delcorn. Grandma, send more chocolate, no big cookies, please. So that's eight words, unless you're going to try and cheese it and say that a hyphenated word, a compound word, is actually one word. In which case, as a PC, then you're saying, well, that's seven, so that means I still have extra words left if I'm limited to 25. <laughs> so here we go by level three spells so we're talking level five characters they can instantaneously speak with anyone with whom they are familiar i presume by level five they'll have gotten out and seen more of the world but now it's an instant communication method good morning roman welcome it's good to see you again Now you have speak with dead and speak with plants also at this level. 
this communication, you know, speak with dead. Mm, is it, uh, is this making your world smaller? Well, that depends. Is it a foreign fighter who has fallen in a field <laughs> and other words that begin with F? If so, you can speak with dead and learn a little bit more about the world around you by asking it questions. Speak with plants, you can uh, communicate more with plants that might already communicate through uh, other means. You know, like, I don't know, like smells or pheromones. Or they have something kind of like they're all playing footsie with their roots. Or you can just learn about what's going on in the world around you from a tree. Why spend five days exploring the woods when you can talk to the tree in the middle of the woods and get all the information you could hope to want? So that's shaved five days of exploration off of your busy schedule as an adventurer. Foreign invaders question their dead, then raise them. Sounds pretty methodical. Is that in? Is that in the uh, the, the king's the king's handbook? Tongues is the opposite of comprehend. Comprehend, you can understand languages, but you can't speak them. Tongues, now you can speak any language natively like you grew up in that area. Awaken. Now, why is Waken a communication spell that can make your world a little bit smaller? Well, it's a level 5 spell. Now, yeah, come on. After spending the casting time tracing magical pathways within a precious gemstone, you touch a huge or smaller beast or plant. The target must have either no intelligence score or an intelligence of 3 or less. The target gains an intelligence of 10. The target also gains the ability to speak one language you know. If the target is a plant, it gains the ability to move its limbs, roots, vines, creepers, and so forth. And it gains senses similar to a human's. Your DM chooses statistics appropriate for the awakened plant, such as the statistics for an awakened shrub or an awakened tree. The awakened beast or plant is charmed by you for 30 days or until you or your companions do anything harmful to it. When the charmed condition ends, the awakened creature chooses whether to remain friendly to you based on how you treated it while it was charmed. So this is, you are creating now sentient life. At level, uh, at, uh, with level, uh, five magic, which is like a level seven adventure, if I recall correctly. Um, that's a big responsibility in itself, by the way. Um, but if now these animals and trees can talk and think freely, think of all of the communication you've learned from all the places that they've been. Especially if you talk to a, um, a, a migrating bird. Think of all the lands that bird has seen and can now tell you about now at level five. Well, level five uh, magic anyway. Dark Wolf, comprehend language versus tongues equals speak to bees versus bee speak. <laughs> Del Corey, if you think about it, zombies look a lot like people covered in guacamole. Hey, now, that may be true, but come on. <laughs> King says, uh, it's in the True Good Scouts Encyclopedia for success. <laughs> Authored by uh, by Prop E. Ganda. <laughs> yeah, getting plot hooks from a bird would be pretty cool. I, I agree. Look, you're a, a migrating bird or even a migrating butterfly or something uh, comes to your small farming village and... And says, by the way, I know it's early. I'm supposed to be leaving, you know, next season. We had to get out of there because everything's getting burnt down. And so you you have a bird just come out and help, <laughs> help. And you understand it's saying help and not chirp, chirp or something. So even early level on here with animal messenger, like you want to talk about delivering a plot hook uh, or, or like communicating with someone, even here with level two spells. That's level three. A level three adventurer can cast this spell. Uh, then you have dream. Dream. 
This spell shapes a creature's dreams. Choose a creature known to you as the target of this spell. The target must be on the same plane of existence as you, so it's very limiting, right? <laughs> Creatures that don't sleep, such as elves, can't be contacted by this spell. You or a willing creature you touch enters a trance state, acting as a messenger. While in the trance, the messenger is aware of his or her surroundings, but can't take actions or move. If the target is asleep, the messenger appears in the target's dreams and can converse with the target as long as it remains asleep, through the duration of the spell. The messenger can also shape the environment of the dream, creating landscapes, objects, and other images. The messenger can emerge from the trance at any time, ending the effect of the spell early. The target recalls the dream perfectly upon awakening. Or upon wake, uh, waking. If the target is awake when you cast the spell, the messenger knows it and can either end the trance in the spell or wait for the target to fall asleep. Uh, you can make the messenger appear monstrous and terrifying to the target. If you do, the messenger can deliver a message of no more than ten words, and the target must make a wisdom saving throw. On a failed save, echoes of the phantasmal monstrosity spawn a nightmare that lasts the duration of the target's sleep and prevents the target from gaining any benefit from that rest. In addition, the target wakes up. It takes 3d6 psychic damage. If you have a body part, lock of hair, clipping from a nail, or similar portion of the target's body, the target makes its saving throw with disadvantage. Um, this is, again, a level 5 spell. So you are you can rock this, I think, at level 7 as an adventurer. You can provide an 8-hour long, fully detailed PowerPoint session, complete with holographic plans for the Death Star complete with uh, a total understanding of each other's languages. It's just that the other person has to be asleep and you can, you know, you're, you're Tony Stark with Jarvis. You know, you can construct molecules in the dream. You can present whatever you want in the dream and you can even be attacked in your dream. So if you're familiar with the big bad evil guy or the big bad evil guy's familiar with you, you might just get terrorized uh, with a level five spell and you want to talk about power <clears throat> pardon me you want to talk about power if you don't get the benefits of a long rest you're not getting a lot of your abilities and spells back you uh and you might even suffer exhaustion dream can be a a very horrifying spell to cast on someone and especially if you're a creeper and you stole a lock of their hair in the middle of the night or something or, like, you, you snagged a shirt off their, uh, their their clothesline or something. Or, I don't know, you have some fingernails or whatever. You pulled a tooth. You can wreck people at with this level 5 spell. And you can convey... As long as they're on the same plane of existence, you can convey with perfect, vivid detail anything you wanted to. That's vi uh, visual or audio. And so your world has gotten a lot smaller... So long as you know the target. And that's going to come down to your DM to say, well, look, do you know do you know Benavre Truegood? You know his name, but do you know him enough to send him a dream? King Von Alley, wind shrieked and uh wind shriek and sky cold. Fly to summer waters to find the city of gold. A city of gold. What did that bird say? City of gold, city of gold, die, 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 die. Well, let's not go there then. <laughs> <laughs> Delcorin was the bird a giant condor made of gold Norton the Knoll walks over to a door noticing he now has a bit of difficulty getting through to his bigger size gah there's the thing I didn't count on well alright technically Norton the fang is still a medium sized creature the big thing that changed is you are now considered to be a fiend and not a humanoid So yes, Dream is powerful, and uh, it, it effectively lets you travel wherever you'd like. And it's not just... Um, it, while, the, while the receiver of the Dream can't manipulate it as such, unless your DM says otherwise, um, that maybe they can, but the, the Dream recipient can then present information back to the caster itself. 
It was a tiny bird, and there's 50 of them all shrieking and cackling at you. <laughs> city of gold. City of gold. City of gold. City. 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 Gold. Go die. 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 City die. <laughs> Interesting. I still have my own mind, right? Norton may need to go to school. Uh, yes, I believe you still have your own mind as we looked at the stat block over here, Norton. Well, that's a basilisk. But, uh, yeah, I believe so. You just, you're chosen and some things about you change. You get a little tougher and you tend to be the alpha of the pack because it says once a fang of Yangu is chosen, the pack's population rises shortly thereafter. And, of course, telepathy. Telepathy is telepathy. And Now, this is a level 8 spell. We're talking a higher level character. But the world is going to get smaller when you can just have telepathic uh, conversations with people all over. Now, you can make the world smaller as PCs or as a DM have your world made smaller through different travel spells. Now, there's something simple. Look, Long Strider. Let's go to that. You touch a creature that targets speed increases by 10 feet until the spell ends. So you get a little bit of a boost. Um... It can make the travel go a little bit more quickly, right? You cast Long Strider on your horse, on your giant flying eagle that you're riding. You cast Long Strider on yourself, and you get a little bit more. Uh, you get a little bit more distance for that hour that it, that you cast it. You know, maybe, maybe instead of the extra speed, your DM might say, "Well, you can avoid exhaustion if you move uh, flat out at the at uh, you know the force march pace." But the long strider will just cancel out the exhaustion. Well, hey, you've been able to travel even more, and for the for the cost of one hour in a spell slot. Uh oh, King is uh, King is tempting Norton the Knoll here. <laughs> then you have a spell like Tensor's Floating Disc, which can allow you to carry someone or something uh, on a disc that floats so you can presumably avoid difficult terrain. Uh, there's Fine Steed. Paladins get this where you can just summon a horse. Now, this can cause some problems as well. Let's say that, I don't know, everyone in the party is a, a non-paladin and a paladin casts Fine Steed and now everyone in the party but... or uh, everyone in the party doesn't have a horse and the paladin does. Well, the party can only move as fast as its slowest character. Does that mean everyone else is going to have to go out and be forced to buy mounts? Does that mean that the paladin has volunteered to uh, use its noble mount as a cart-pulling horse and everyone gets to ride in the back? Maybe. And if that's the case, then you have a magical steed that doesn't have a lot of the same requirements that normal horses do at a relatively low level that is pulling everyone in the back or maybe someone on top too uh oh <laughs> king is uh king is is very much tempting uh, fate here <laughs> at level 3 uh, there is, uh, there's create, oh, that, that was, uh, create, uh, Fey and, hmm, oh. shame on me. There are the conjures as well, by the way, not to, oh, oh no, I'm sorry, this is create food and water. Why is this a travel spell? If you don't have to go out of your way to do survival checks to forage... And you can just create food and water. Then you can march or take a cart ride. You've limited the amount of expenditure of time and or money that your party needs to put into maintaining itself. In that case, 
um, you can do more things more quickly. And so your world has gotten smaller or the timetables have, uh, have diminished because it's one less thing you have to worry about or do. You can conjure animals or you can cast the fly spell at level three. Yeah, you get it only at level three. It gives you a fly speed of 60. And so that means you can travel quite a ways. Now, fly doesn't last a long time. Here, we'll go to it real quick. That was fine steed up there. You touch a willing creature, the target gains a flying speed of 60 feet for 10 minutes. Now, when the spell ends, the target falls as if still if it's still aloft, unless it can stop the fall. When you cast this spell using a spell slot of 4th level or higher, you can target one additional creature for every slot above 3rd. So, it's only, only 10 minutes, though that's 100 rounds... At, uh, that's a hundred rounds at, uh, uh, that's a gains a flying speed of 60. So what, uh, what that means is if you can move and dash, right? If so, you're, you're kind of double moving. That's 120 feet per round. There are 10 rounds in a minute. Times 10 minutes. So you can move 12,000 feet in 10 minutes. This is this is flying. So you can go up and over uh, mountains or obstacles or forests or whatever. And you get pure movement in that direction. Oh, actually, hang on. I, I should have done that again. So that's 120. Let's do this in miles per hour. Times 10 times 60 divided by... So that's letting you fly at about 14 miles an hour, but for only 10 minutes. But So however you want to calculate that, um, that's a good burst of speed that that can take you in good leaps and bounds ahead uh it's a good idea to require the players to have the actual spell component required for some of these spells and not just allow them to cast things willy-nilly or to ban the spell outright for defying the survival thematic of the campaign. Uh, yes, that is a meta consideration. That is something you would want to go over with your players. Um, and King brings up the point too. Look, some you might just take a focus as the material component for a spell. That means that you don't have to have a wing feather from any bird. So you might want to have that meta conversation and say all of your casting can be done with an implement or everyone has to have component pouches. And come on, I want you to tell me what's in your component pouches. I want you to keep an inventory. Uh, and so that king is true. If you control the methods by which you cast the spells, you can limit the amount of times that the spells are present. Yeah, if you want to link it, King, that's perfectly fine. <laughs> Death count just sort of concedes. So yeah, uh, it, if if you want this, and remember, it's not just flying, you know, three feet. It's not a hover speed. As a level three spell, your characters can fly... 12,000 feet. Is that enough? Is that enough to get to the top of the evil general's uh, keep where his bedroom is? Probably. Now, would they just want to go right to the to the top of the keep and confront the general instead of going through the other, you know, levels of it? Uh, I don't know. That's going to be up to you to consider, right? We're bringing up considerations for you as a DM. 
if I'm a PC and I can cast fly and I don't have to worry about scaling walls, getting caught by soldiers, getting mauled by guard dogs, uh, having to avoid all of this other stuff, if I can just fly to the top and, uh, and bring others with me some way, somehow, um, yeah, and that, that's a limiting factor of this spell too, is that, you know, you have to upcast it to, to get, uh, to get more people. But can we just go straight to the evil general's bedroom and try and murder him in his sleep? Hey, we avoided the whole dungeon, but we got the job done. How does one deal with ten gnolls attacking at once? Uh, that would depend on any powers or features or ingenuity that he has. I'll, I'll bring this up, uh, death count. As, or, uh... Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll play this here towards the end. This looks like this is going to be fun. <laughs> Skip the trash mobs and go straight to the boss, shaving off, uh, shaving off three hours of blah, says Delcorn. You must design things different if his bad guys are uh, in reach of a fly spell without any obstacles. And, and that's true. You know, is this world, or does this world consider the fly spell as a bread and butter spell? And so feasibly all castles have defenses against flying creatures? Maybe. Um, or do you as a DM, you know, uh, do you want to allow the spell? You could just say no to some spells. I do that. Um, but just think about how that is going to affect your campaigns. If your PCs can just fly to the end of an area, you know, do you have an outdoor maze kind of like in Breath of the Wild? Well, you could just scout the area from the air not have to worry about being attacked and find the juicy middle and go, woo, hey, I solved the maze. Look at me. Give me a treasure. Anti-aircraft ballista with nets on them rather than spears. Yeah, they, they're restrained and they, woo, they fall. Um, so yeah, th that's something you have to think about. Not just for distance and travel, but for what you're looking to do. 10 minutes of flying at 14 miles an hour, right? That's 12,000 feet. How far up a mountain can you get? You know, think of the opening of uh, Star Trek, the Star Trek movie 4, was it? You had uh, Kirk and Bones who were climbing a mountainside manually. And Spock just puts on hover boots and flies up to him and has a conversation. You know, and he doesn't have to do anything more than just stand there. It is concentration, Evalon. So yeah, if you're hit by an arrow, you could possibly break concentration. Um, there, I'm not saying that it's a broken spell or anything. There are ways you can counter it. But it's something that maybe not a lot of DMs, especially newer or first-time ones, may be aware of. Or a player might hinge an entire plan and forget about concentration. Oh, Evelyn, uh, yeah, Evelyn, I'm with you. Dark Wolf, you, you gotta share. Come on. Come on. You gotta share. I'm guilty of thinking a lot like Spock. And, you know, that's it doesn't make you a bad player at all. And I, I know that you're not saying that you are, and I'm not saying that uh, that people like that are. But players want to be efficient. They want to be safe, right? They, why risk yourself in, you know, going through an entire dungeon crawl inside of a keep, you know, to, to become battered and bloody at the, at the enemy when you could just fly over the wall? Especially if they don't care about any, like, treasure or secret doors or, you know, something like that. If they don't care about that and they want to go straight to the point, they're going to do so. Uh, Phantom Steed also at level 3. Now you don't even have to upkeep your horses. You can just summon magical horses and ride them or have them pull your gear and your yourself. Oh, thank you, Dark Wolf. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> This is a big time saver for a party. Now you have steeds. 
when you want them. And you have enough for everyone, including maybe a hireling or an NPC or something like that. Or if you have a treasure wagon, right? Everyone rides a horse and you have one or two horses pulling a treasure wagon behind you. Um, Phantom Steed can do that. And now, now all you have to do is expend a little bit of magic and your traveling is made that much easier. Here, I'll go to it real quick. A large, quasi-real, horse-like creature appears on the ground in an unoccupied space of your choice within range. You decide the creature's appearance, but it's equipped with a saddle, bit, and bridle. Any of the equipment created by the spell vanishes in a puff of smoke if he's carried more than 10 feet away from the steed. For the duration, you or a creature you choose can ride the steed. The creature uses the statistics for a riding horse, except it has a speed of 100 feet and can travel 10 miles in an hour or 13 miles at a fast pace. When the spell ends, the steed gradually fades, giving the rider one minute to dismount. The spell ends if you use an action to dismiss it or the steed takes any damage. So for an hour at a time, you can move, well, you can move 10 miles an hour with this phantom steed. And uh, presumably here, if it has all this gear, you could hook a wagon up to it. So you can get these bursts of speed. It does have the drawback that if it takes any damage, one point of damage, it will pop. You know, is Phantom Steed broken? Not necessarily, no. Um, but this is a way that, again, your players can make your world a little smaller or a little less uh, uh, dangerous than you had hoped. Because look, a speed of 100, if you're being chased by a zombie horde, everyone gets in the wagon and uh, it, the casting time is one minute uh, for this ritual. And it's a ritual, so it's unlimited use, right? Cast it every day, and uh, and so effectively you're moving, you you're moving uh, 80 miles over eight hours if you're doing normal time, or you can push yourself and go further. But every casting is effectively giving uh, one hour. Now, if you have like five players, so it's going to be five minutes to make horses for everyone. Whoopity do! But now everyone there. You know, can uh, can go along and uh, and move at ten miles an hour without any sort of fatigue, especially on the horse. And depending as a DM, if you if they're not being chased, if it's not stressful, uh, the component is only verbal and somatic. So there's a chance that you as a DM, uh, whether it's convenient for you to have your players be able to generate horses or something along those lines. Because they're not under duress, the caster might just continually recast the steeds while they're riding on the steeds. Uh, Norton says, check out his new character. Um, a female fairy fighter. FFF. <laughs> there you go, death count. You may now serve King Von Ale proudly. No, it it won't take uh, it won't take an hour, Ivlon. Uh, it only takes a minute. Casting time one minute. So what, five or six minutes, and you have enough horses to to uh, take you ten miles in an hour. And again, you might even be allowed as a PC to recast the ritual on horseback because it's just verbal and somatic components. Yeah, see, Death Count, Ivalon's in your corner. Dark Wolf might think so too. Oh, well, I, I'm, I'm sorry. So yes, it, it might take... Uh, if you burn the spell slot, yes. Uh, otherwise, it is... Uh, yeah. Uh, but if, if, if you want to move, that's true. Uh, Ivalon, I'm sorry that I, I forgot, I did forget to plug that in there. But if you are in a hurry and you want to make some time, you want to get out of there, or you really want to get a burst of speed, maybe it's the end of the day, and you want to get as far as you can, burn those spell slots up before you make camp.
Good morning, Upos. Welcome to the conversation. Control water is a level four spell. Why is this a travel? Uh, why is this a travel spell? Because you can put a current behind your boat or your raft. Are you in a river or a lake or you're out in the ocean? Control water can give you an extra boost. Is it going to be statistically huge? Well, I mean, crossing an ocean, probably not. Going down a river or going across a lake, probably a little bit more so. But just remember that this control water has that use as well. It can push nautical well bodies or also nautical vehicles more quickly. Dimension door? Well, this was brought up actually not that long ago in the in chat with roleplay. If we go up to dimension door, now this doesn't make, you know, the whole wide world a little smaller, but this does do a couple interesting things. You teleport yourself from your current location to any other spot within range, which is 500 feet. You arrive exactly at the spot desired. It can be a place you can see or one you can visualize or one you can describe by stating distance and direction, such as 200 feet straight downward or upward to the northwest at a 45 degree angle, 300 feet. You can bring along objects as long as their weight doesn't exceed what you can carry. You can also bring one willing creature of your size or smaller who is carrying gear up to its carrying capacity. The creature must be within five feet of you when you cast the spell. If you would arrive in a place already occupied by an object or creature, you uh, and uh, you and any creature traveling with you each take 46 force damage, and the spell fails to teleport you. So that can be a quick, you know, hey, we got to get out of here, or we have to get into here. That said, this is another spell that can presumably instantly bypass mechanics in your dungeon, or... You can use it to escape a boss fight that you that you wanted to, I don't know, introduce something in. Or even to get into the boss fight. That kind of a thing. Um, you know, crafty players might want to go and search for the plans for the keep. And as, and learn them. So that they can make these sort of judgment calls with uh, D-Door. Yep, it, uh, Delcorn, it is occupied. Uh, in fact, if you would like to bring up the plan that was uh, that was mentioned on Critical Role, uh, we can get into why why I was uh, hem hawing with you about its uh, effectiveness. While you're doing so, fabricate. Why is fabricate a travel spell? Well, you come to a river and you have to cross it. You look around, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fast river, but this is the shortest way, or this is the way you have to go, or heck, the old bridge had washed out because there's a flood causing Raging River. So your wizard, whoever looks around and says, oh, you know what, there's trees, there's a bridge, let's cross. And suddenly, having to go all the way around, or take an alternate bridge, or cast other spells, um, are made irrelevant because they just fabricated a bridge over the, the ditch, the river, the canyon, or I mean, or chasm or whatever, uh, the hole, whatever's there. Typically, only one character will have D-Door and separating themselves from the party can be risky. That That is true. Though, if you have something like, I'm just going to plant a bomb and get out of there. No. All right, FFT is up. Got to talk shop about his online campaign we're going to get going. All right, King. <laughs> that, that's fine. Go ahead and lurk, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you around. Delcorn, back in episode 54 of Critical Role, uh, when the party was about to fight the Black Dragon, a plan B was suggested where someone would dimension door into a dragon's stomach and place an immovable rod so it couldn't take off. So, while the plan is creative... And we'll get into what a um, an immovable rod is also, because that's a part of the plan. Um, Dimension Door would have them bounce. Like, the, the teleport wouldn't even go off. The spell would look at them and say, no, stop it, and, and hit them back. Of course, this is at DM discretion. If the DM really liked this plan and wanted it to succeed, he could say, yeah, there's an empty stomach that you can teleport into. Would I do that? No. 
Um, I'd still compliment my players and say that's a really cool idea, but it's not going to work. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so the, the space is already occupied by the very creature the space is a part of. As well, they would have to presumably know the biology of the dragon. Where's its stomach? Where's it? Where's the parts inside of it? Um, and then if we look at, uh, at the immovable rod... It's a shame King uh, King left and entered lurk mode. He, I think he'd like a conversation like this. Um, this flat iron rod has a button on one end. You can use an action to press the button, which causes the rod to become magically fixed in place. Until you or another creature uses an action to push the button again, the rod doesn't move, even if it's defying gravity. The rod can hold up to 8,000 pounds of weight. More weight causes the rod to deactivate and fall. A creature can use an action to make a DC 30 strength check, moving the fixed rod up to 10 feet on a success. Well, depending on the size of the dragon, the dragon might bust that, uh, might bust that limit already. Um, Death Count says the DM had the role to see if it even works or they get a backlash. Well, yeah, but it, well, for Dimension Door, yeah, it, the, though the spell does say if it's an occupied space, they just, the teleport fails and they take the 46. And, and so that's if the DM even wants to allow that. So what you're, what you're seeing here, uh, Del Corin, the, the size of the dragon itself may already break the capacity. Also, um, if it's inside of a creature that's writhing around, what are the odds that all of those tissues and muscles and everything are going to click the button on the side? Yeah, so it's probably going it might, to... It might very well break that... Uh, I, I, don't, I mean, whatever the weight of a dragon is. It might break that, but if it's writhing around, it's probably going to click the button. How many times have you butt-dialed someone on a phone not to have a big button on the side of this rod get uh, caressed with stomach tissue? Um, as well, you're looking at what is the intention of the immovable rod. If we look at the broadest, if we look at the broadest definition of the immovable rod... It is a fixed point in the universe, right? You click it in place, and um, now you're imagining someone butt dialing an immovable rod. Yeah, so you see someone like walking down the street, and they just stop every now and again. <laughs> um, if that's the case, as soon as they click that rod, it is going to fly off, fly off, at the speed that the planet spins through the galaxy. Because it is a fixed point in the universe, and the planet is departing at, what, a thousand kilometers an hour, or however fast we're spinning, uh, we're spinning through space. Now, we'll see it again next year, and it'll reap a bloody harvest as it just, like, grazes back over the Earth, as it comes back again through that fixed point in space. Um, or you can look at it as, alright, so, it's, it, it's not in the universe, it's to the world. Okay, well then, does does it fly off at the speed that we rotate? Like, not have revolutions, but the speed that the planet rotates? Well, no, of course, don't, don't be silly. It, it, it's, it's meant for where it is. It's supposed to stay put, um, you know, where I want it to be. And, you, and then you say, all right, so you want it... Uh, in fact, uh, one thing that you can do, Delcorin, with the movable rods... Uh, let me find an example. Here, I have my Eve hypo. And I have my phone. These are immovable rods, right? So, what you do if you're a strong character is you go like this. Ugh. Click. Ugh. And then you have a ladder made of two immovable rods that you continually climb and drag yourself up. Um, so, if that's the case, then... You say, well, I, I want it kind of I want it where I'm intending it to be. 
You know, I want it. I want to place it here. Okay, now I want it here. Now I want it here. So I don't want it flying off the world. That's dumb. That makes no sense. Why would someone make a rod like that? Because your DM would do that. Um, and then you can say as a DM, all right, well, that's fine. If you intend for this rod to be inside the dragon's stomach, it will just stay inside the dragon's stomach. The dragon can move wherever it wants. It's just going to have an immovable rod inside of it the whole time. You'd, you'd use it as a coat hanger. It's a very expensive coat hanger. But uh, if you wish to show off your wealth, though, Corin, then you can do so. Yeah, it's also a fixed point for attaching rope to other party members. And again, you can use it as a as a two, as like a, a click, uh, uh, an emergency ladder if you need it. So so that's why it's a it's a, not a bad plan. I get what they're doing. They want to try and pin the dragon down. Um, but depending on the item, the intention, or just the physical description of the item, it wouldn't be practical to do. It's a fun idea, though. And you know what? If you're a DM who wants to try and reward that creativity, then do it. Allow your PCs to, to try it. You would just need to make sure... Um, yeah, well, you can get back out uh, without being you know pushed out naturally from the uh, digestion process. Um, you would just need to make sure if you do this, but you say, okay, I like this idea... You as a DM say, I'm allowing it in this circumstance. Otherwise, I'm not going to allow you to telefrag my monsters. Because that's effectively what's happening. Oh, a truly immovable rod. Oh, yeah, the, the universal still point. There you go. Yep. Yep, there you go. King King put a good link up. Uh, polymorph. Turn yourself into a giant eagle and gain a 60 fly speed and uh, fly over the evil haunted woods to get to the other side. Yes, it is a new bag of weirdness. Um... Polymorph is... <laughs> we already went through the polymorph and bag of holding <laughs> trick in another DM advice segment. Uh, I'll, I'll make sure to, to put a link. To, when this eventually gets on YouTube, I'll make sure to put a link to that as well. Uh, but in the travel sense, look. You're a bird. Fly over the haunted woods. You as a DM say, oh, but I wanted them to have encounters and even find treasure in the woods. And your players say, we want to get to the end of the woods. We have a quest. Uh, we have a quest to go on. The princess needs saving. Why do I want to fight a, a, a skeleton in the woods? Conjure elementals. And to this extent, the circle of the moon druids can turn into elementals. The air elemental gives you a 90 move speed. So you are traveling a little less, uh, a little less quickly than the phantom steed. But you can last that way for hours and go at like nine miles an hour flying speed. So Conjure Elemental and especially that shapeshift for druids as we're talking about polymorph and elementals, those can be big, um, big ways to make your world smaller. My advice to DMs is to give them encounters. Just being in the air doesn't mean you can't have encounters. That's true. Um, there's also a, is it worth it? Or I'd rather reward their ingenuity than not. Uh, th th I'm, I'm not presenting, I'm not poo-pooing your idea, Evelon. If you want an encounter as a DM, you'll give them an encounter. Uh, because there are, there are creatures that can fly faster than a raven. And if you polymorphed yourself into a raven, guess how many hit points you have? Here's a hint. Do you get slow fall after you are knocked out of raven form? Here's a hint. <laughs> T 
Teleportation Circle, aha. By level five, level five spells, that is, a bard, not even a wizard with some, you know, arcane stuff here, uh, can use teleportation circles. What is a teleportation circle, you ask? That's a very good question. As you cast the spell, you draw a 10-foot diameter circle on the ground inscribed with sigils that link your location to a permanent teleportation circle of your choice whose sigil sequence you know and that is on the same plane of existence as you. A shimmering portal opens within the circle you drew and remains open until the end of your next turn. Any creature that enters the portal instantly appears within five feet of the destination circle or in the nearest unoccupied space if that space is occupied. Many major temples, guilds, and other important places have permanent teleportation circles inscribed somewhere within their confines. Each such circle includes a unique sigil sequence, a string of magical runes arranged in a particular pattern. When you first gain the ability to cast this spell, you learn the sigil sequences for two destinations on the material plane determined by the DM. You can learn additional sig uh, sigil sequences during your adventures. You can commit a new sigil sequence to memory after studying it for one minute. Right? So you have a stargate. You can create a permanent teleportation circle by casting this spell in the same location every day for one year. You need not use the circle to teleport when you cast the spell in this way. Now suddenly, by level 7, and you have access to level 5 spells, you can go to big major locations. And what does that mean? It means you can uh, gather and sell resources more quickly gather or sell information more quickly, make more acquaintances that you can now send uh, whispers or messages, animal messengers or uh, sendings or dreams because you're familiar with more people. And it's saving you hundreds, thousands of miles of travel time even, as long as you know the sigil sequence. And do you have to even learn it? I don't know. What if in a treasure, uh, a treasure parcel, you get the sigil sequence to... The capital city's, uh, I don't know, like the public fountain or something. Well, now you can go from where you're at to the capital city that's a thousand miles away in, uh, let's see, it's uh, in one minute. And it does cost uh, 50 gold pieces. 50 gold to travel a thousand miles in a minute? Hey, that's pretty good, right? Now, getting back could be a problem, but if that's where they need to go then there, why travel over land? Why risk getting robbed on the highway? Why risk random encounters when you can just cast teleportation circle and boop, there you go. Windwalk. You get a fly speed of 35 miles an hour. And you can... Uh, yeah, it, it depends on the scarcity of the material components. Um, chalks and inks infused with precious gems. Um, you know, if you're a rich party, if not, and you can't pay the 50 gold, because let's face it, a gold a day is, is like a, a wage for, for a, like a peasant or a worker. Um, it's something along those lines. So let's look at Windwalk. This is 35 miles an hour and it lasts eight hours. You can fly away from a, anything, really. You're faster than an air elemental. Uh, you're faster than a dragon. You're faster than land vehicles and water vehicles. Um, if we look here... Okay, in one casting of Windwalk, you can move 280 miles. Now there's there are drawbacks... You can't speak or take other actions. So you as a party are just sort of like silently blowing by as little clouds. Now, could you argue, well, our party made hand signals. Well, you, you assume kind of a gaseous form. I don't know. That's going to be up to you as a DM. 
but at its core, if you can afford to do this, you can travel 280 miles per cast. Windwalk does have a, um, a material component of some fire and holy water. Now, if you can make holy water, or you have it, or you found it, or you bought it, there you go. Um, so you can cast this repeatedly. But uh, this is a really, really good spell for traveling. Um, you, you turn into a gaseous form of the duration. You appear as wisps of cloud. While in this form, you have a flying speed of 300 feet and has resistance to damage from non-magical weapons. Um, and by the way, this isn't even concentration. You can fly over a battlefield and they can riddle you with arrows and you won't drop it. And if they're non-magical arrows, you'll only take half damage from them anyway. And also, why are you flying within archery distance? If you're a cloud, go up to 300 feet cruising distance and then go back down. So this is a get out of, you know, hey, we got to get out of here right now. Um, well, within a minute anyway, because of the casting time. Uh, but it's a get out of here. And it's also a, it's an overland travel spell. Conjure Celestial, same thing. Etherealness, you can pass through walls. So by level 7, it counts as difficult terrain. But you, you can have players that can just phase through walls. Or the ground, or whatever. It halves their speed, but again... If one wall separates them from a hallway and, you know, two hours of combat and traps and the, the evil king on the throne, they're gonna, they might just go through the wall and bypass that. So it's something to consider. And again, I'm not saying this to create contention or suspicion between DMs and PCs. Uh, that, that's not the point. Uh, and a little bit of knowledge. This might not have as big an effect. But again, if if we live in an age where I can go, I can get news from Japan printed in English. I just go to a website. I can I can learn what's happening in South America, in England. I can learn about what's happening in Germany or Belgium or other places in just a couple seconds. That makes your world as a DM smaller also. Because now your players have many more options and contacts and ways to process information that you should be cognizant of when you're planning your dungeon, campaign, module, or whatever. You know, B sense, this lets you look through the eyes of a, a bird or a, a bee or whatever, and they can navigate through perhaps easier than you can. You have locate, uh, animal, person, or object. Augury and other divination spells like this can reveal a lot of information. Uh, even if it's a yes-no answer, it can save an entire journey to a mountain where there's nothing. Locate creature, locate object, uh, commune with a... You know, so the commune is like with this uh, extra planar being, a god or something. Then you have commune with nature. This in a uh, this is in a three-mile radius around you. It's like a radar or a sonar or some other detection settlements and creatures and monsters and people and all of this so if you're getting it's so it's not even really three miles right calculate the area of a circle that has a radius of three miles go ahead go ahead <laughs> um you're getting that many miles worth of information all around you so that you might avoid or find things, or you're, as a DM, you might have to generate content on the fly. Legend lore. Oh, Scrying and Arcane Eye. These are, these are two that they do have some writers of... Well, Scrying might have a writer of familiarity, but the, you can be vague about things with it, too. It just won't be as potent. But Scrying, I'll, I'm going to go... I'll look at anything on the same plane that I exist on. Arcane Eye is like a security camera that you can float around. I'm going to float this Arcane Eye through the dungeon ahead of me and see if there's any traps. Or I'm going to float the Arcane Eye up to the general's bedroom at the top of the castle and see if he's sleeping there. 
And if he is, then, hey, we'll just teleport or fly up. Or we'll measure, is the risk worth or the reward for going through everything? Or I will send my arcane eye, like this little satellite, or a little drone is really kind of what it is, uh, to use modern parlance. You send a drone out, and you can, you're getting what's happening. And this isn't even talking now about familiars. If you have a familiar or a homunculus as a wizard or another class that gets something like that, that's another set of eyes in the world. Another uh, another set of wings or claws that can fly or swim or crawl around and give you so much more information about the world more quickly than you would have gotten otherwise. Find the path and astral projection is more of a knowledge because you're not exactly you as you project astrally, but you can sense things and do some interaction and whatnot. Um, so... These are things to consider as a DM, how your world will gradually become smaller and smaller as you have PCs, especially, look, if you have a druid and a wizard and a bard, and then whoever else, th your game is going to get way different in the end game. They are going to be sending messages or, or even se they'll send sendings. They're going to teleport. They're going to wind walk. Uh, your, your cleric is going to use word of recall. You and up to five willing creatures within five feet of you instantly teleport to a previously designated sanctuary. You and any creatures that teleport with you appear in the nearest unoccupied space to the spot you designated when you prepared your sanctuary. Um... If you cast a spell without preparing a sanctuary, the spell has no effect. You must designate a sanctuary by casting this spell within a location such as a temple dedicated to or strongly linked to your deity. If you attempt to cast the spell in this manner in an area that isn't dedicated to your deity, the spell has no effect. So here, you and up to five creatures around you are instantly gone. Now, you as a DM can say, well, you can only have one word of recall location at a time. Could you read that from the script? Yes. Could you have multiple? In that case, so, I don't know, you follow the very popular religion. Uh, you know, it's a lord of light or healing or something. You can now pop from city to city with the party instantaneously and appear in presumably a safe, uh, a safe location that's friendly to you. So, and we're not talking about vague classes, like, I don't know, warlock. Well, who has really heard of a warlock or gotten to play with it that much? We're talking clerics, druids, and wizards, and bards now. Bards might be a surprise from before, because they were arcane casters, but not necessarily eh. But bards get this stuff. Um, so, as you get to higher levels in your campaign, be prepared to offer content on an EXP or milestone basis that reflects the fact that they can travel quickly, relatively safely, question mark? And all of a sudden, where you might have given them a milestone because they met the mayor of the next town and they sat down for dinner and, and impressed them, now because they can pop to the major city so easily, maybe they have to uh, impress five nobles before they can get that same uh, that same milestone. Yes, a, a, a noble is even more than you know the local mayor of the town next over to your farming village. But the the task isn't as complex. You didn't learn as much along the way because you're skipping so much content. I don't know if you... It might be content, how, however you want to uh, call it. But your players are skipping so much travel, content, and other experience that if they're, if they're making a game now about who knows who, then your EXP and your milestones have to fall on there. And now travel in a lot of your world can become very irrelevant. Because now it's more about who you know and the location on the map that you're traveling. And not necessarily about the journey that you were taking before in your cart or on foot. Or, you know, you, you got that old, you know, that broken down donkey. And you got the rickety cart from your dad on the farm. Because he could still use it on the farm, but he believes in your quest and wanted to send you out. And you go from there. So... Okay, if you have any questions, comments, or whatnot about what was presented or discussed here, please ask about it. Um, I'm going to take about a 10-minute break. I'm going to get a little snack, and uh, I'm going to refill my pitcher with some water, and we'll come back, and hey, 
it's part three, open discussion. We can talk about uh, about our character that we made. We can talk about more about this concept over here about travel and how your world can shrink at later levels. Uh, about the focus of campaigns. If there's a new, or if you're new and you're lurking and you would like to make a character, I can show you how to do that too. It'll be open. So I'll see you in about ten minutes. Okay, everyone.
<clears throat> okay, I have returned. Dun -da -da -da. And in fact, I have uh, I have the video that uh, King had shared, which was topical to what we were discussing: how uh, spells can uh, re redo your your play style. Well, let me come back here. Aha. Uh -huh. So let's check this out and see if we agree, disagree. We can use this to uh, supplement our conversation. So we'll check it out. <laughs> 